So good evening, everybody, and welcome to Allahabad's Find Me. I'll hand it over to the moderators for further proceedings. What do you say? Thank you, Dr. Shok. Uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, wish you all a very happy new year. We all have come from 2022-2021 after having a lot of struggle with the COVID and all those things. And it's our part that we have entered into 2021. Hopefully, we will enjoy this 2021 with a more enthusiasm and more energy. On behalf of Allahabad Orthopedic Society, I, Dr. Manishi Bansal, welcome you all in this Allahabad Spine Meet. I will, it's our privilege and honor that UPOA has given us opportunity to organize this panel meet under the ages of UPOA. I, on behalf of AOS, I welcome the President UPOA, Dr. Apoor Agrawal, and Secretary UPA, Dr. Anup Agrawal, for joining the panelist group. I also welcome Dr. Sanjay Dhaman, the President-elect um, of UPOA, for uh, giving this opportunity to grace the occasion. With us, we have two stalwarts of the spine, Dr. Professor Raj Shekhan, sir, and Dr. Manoj Khatri from UK, who has kindly consented to give their ease of wisdom and knowledge so that we can enrich our knowledge and ultimately goes to the society. So now we also welcome Dr. Shah Waliullah and Dr. Varun Agrawal, who is uh, a regular spinal surgeons and doing a lot of spine surgery in this part of the world. So it's my proud privilege and honor to introduce first a legendary figure in the orthopedic world who actually need no introduction. He himself is an institution and a man with par excellence qualities. I humbly request Chairman, Department of Orthopedics and Spine Surgery, Ganga Hospital, and first International Chair from Asia Pacific Region for AO Spine, past President Seacott, President CSRS AP, Adjunct Professor Tamil Nadu, Dr. MGR Medical University, Hunterian Professor, Royal College of Surgeons of England, 2011-12, Chairperson, AO Spine International Research Commission, Past President Indian Orthopedic Association, Past President Association of Spine Surgeons of India, Past President ISS LS Canada, Professor Dr. R.S. Rajshekran sir to today's spinal meet. It's a matter of proud and honor to welcome you, sir. If I keep on enumerating the publications, awards, and achievements of Professor Rajshekran sir, I think our whole slot of today's meet will be shortened and we will be deprived from his wisdom and knowledge. Treatment of thoracolumbar injuries is a still a controversial issue. We have a lot of myths regarding the thoracolumbar injuries. So now I request Professor Rajsekhan sir to deliver his talk on the subject and help us in making a guideline for the management of such fractures. I also welcome on behalf of AOS, all the delegates who have joined this Allahabad orthopedic uh, spinal meet and all the luminaries and uh, dignitaries who have joined because we cannot see them from right from here, but I welcome you all, sir. Welcome you. Dr. Raj Shekhan, sir, please. I think Manishi, Dr. Raj Shekhan has some urgent meeting now. Uh, I would request he send his video just now. Dr. Ashok Shyam, kindly just uh, run his video, please. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to thank all of you for this uh, honor and pleasure of uh, being with you today. And also to share my views on the topic of what are the current uh, knowledge gaps in thoracolumbar bus fractures. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, privilege again. Now, as you know, thoracolumbar fractures are the most common fractures, forming over 60% of all spine fractures. And they also occupy 60% of the literature. That means there is a lot of confusion regarding this uh, topic. And burst fractures, in fact, have formed the center stage of most uh, controversies. Now, this is a systematic review of literature on this topic. And if you have seen from 1970 to 2001, it looked at papers which have been published for 31 years. And they looked at the top most 132 papers which met the criteria. And what was evident was that there was a wide variation of philosophies and type of management. 
and no evidence to prove superiority of any one of the five methods of treatment which were widely discussed. There was a ocean of level two and three evidence and randomized controlled trials were very, very little. So this subject is very much opinionated and there are more unknowns than what we know for surely. And what is very evident is if you look across the global method in which it is being treated, the treatment is not actually fracture dependent. It is not evidence dependent, but mainly surgeon dependent. So this same fracture can be treated in very many different ways, depending upon whether it's in North America, or Europe, China, or other parts of Asia. So this is something very, very uh, critically important. Now, I would like to talk to you in detail about step-by-step. -step. And for a practicing surgeon, let's start with classification and how much does it help us to decide what is the best form of treatment. Now, there is no controversy at the two ends of the spectrum. For example, in these very stable fractures, nobody is going to operate for uh, any reason. And there is also no problem when you come to the other end of the spectrum, the fracture dislocations, where everybody knows that it is unstable and it requires uh, surgery. But there is a lot of problem in the assessment of severity in the mid zone of the spectrum of severity. And here in A3, A4 and B2 fractures, there is a lot of controversy and there is also a lot of mismanagement because if there is only a burst fracture, a lot of people think it can be treated conservatively. Some people think it should be operated. And many people miss in the radiograph that it is not just a A fracture of the anterior column alone but there is some posterior extent element also. So we have to see what is the current evidence of treatment of uh, A fractures alone. Now let us look at the few randomized controlled trials which are there in thoracolumbar fractures with normal neurology. So how do we treat these when there is no uh, neurology? Now this is an important paper which was published in the spine in 2006, that means almost 14 years uh, before. So they took 16 operative versus 18 non-operative patients. All the surgery was done by short segment stabilization. And they looked at a huge number of functional outcome scores and uh, how much people have returned to previous jobs. And they showed that results were significantly better in the operative group. But you know, this is the, I'm talking about this first because this is the one day paper which has actually showed by a randomized prospective trial that surgery was better than conservative treatment. Now, the reason why they concluded was that the cost for non-operative treatment in that country was very much higher than operative costs. And apart from the direct costs, cost of absenteeism, cost of disablement was very, very high in that group in non-operative patients. And that was the major reason why they advised surgical treatment. And they also con concluded that the indirect cost exceeded the direct cost by far and makes up 95.4% of the total cost. Now, if you're treating a patient by non-operative method, we should actually take, suppose we advise them rest for five months or six months. This should be explained very clearly to the patient that when you don't operate, the conservative period becomes really prolonged. This is a most quoted paper on uh, uh, this topic, uh, a prospective trial by Wood et al., which was published first in 2005. Now, this was a burst fractures with normal neurology in 47 cases. 24 were operated and 23 were non-operated, and all of them were equally uh, comparable at the start. Very importantly, they found that there was no significant difference between the groups for return to work in pain scores, and complications were much more frequent in the operative group. Now, if you look at the kyphosis between the operative and non-operative final kyphosis, pre-op canal compromise and final follow-up compromise, there is no difference at all. So they concluded that the results are the same, but complications are much more frequent in the operative group. And they also concluded that surgery 
provided no major long-term advantage compared to the non-operative treatment. But you might ask, what about long-term results? Would there be increased kyphosis at long-term? Will there be more pain because of disc degeneration? Will there be less return to work? And is there a danger of them getting into a neurological deficit? So this is something what we are always worried about. But you can see here, over a long period of time, over a period of 15 years, they came back and the same group reported on the same cohort after an average of 20 years follow-up. And again, they showed that in patients with burst fractures without neurological deficit, non-operative group at the 20-year follow-up also showed significantly better scores for pain, ODA scores, and the Roland Morris scores. Also, as we said before, there was less need for resurgery to take out the implants, and implant-related problems were not present in the conservative uh, group. So the Cochrane result that was told by Jingping et al. was also concluded that there is no statistically significant difference in the functional outcome beyond two years. So surgery makes the patient walk faster and return back to work a little earlier in a larger group of patients. But at the end of two years, there is no difference uh, at all between operative and non-operative group. The latest in the group is the Global Spine Journal uh, Review. They looked at uh, 23 level one and two studies were analyzed. And they also have concluded without a doubt that in neurologically intact patients, similar functional outcomes, lower complication rates, and less costs with conservative management when compared with surgical management. So this is very, very important. Now, what about the pain? Now, again, in the present, uh, this paper, uh, a meta-analysis by Sonali et al. in CAR, CORR, it again shows that return to work, radiographic progression of kyphosis, progression of spinal compli stenosis complications and length of the stay, they again found no difference at all. So it is logical that we can conclude that operative management of thoracolumbar burst fractures without neurological deficit may improve residual kyphosis marginally, but does not appear to improve pain or function at an average of four years after injury and is associated with the higher complication rates and costs. Here, we also have to look into what are the complications of surgery. Some of them have an intraoperative neurological injury, they have infection, they have implant breakage, implant-related pain, and this actually can account for 11 to 12%. The second biggest issue is, if you are having pain, is it always from the bone? And what about the discs? Actually, this person, Phillips, actually very clearly studied a large uh, number of patients on what happens to the bone and then what happens to the discs. And then they were able to show that a progressive increase in kyphosis was evident regardless of fusion. So there is a good uh, improvement in kyphosis immediately after the surgery, but then gradually it increased in patients who had a fusion or a non-fusion. And that was because there is an injury to the discs also. So part of the collapse and part of the pain happens because of the injury to the end plate. And then there is an apoptosis of the intervertebral disc cells and leads to disc degeneration. And that can be also a cause of pain. So if you're looking at a patient who has healed and who has come to you with pain, when you're analyzing the x-rays, mm -hmm. always take a stress x-ray and just check whether there is any problem of opening and collapse of the superior disc, which is more often injured than the inferior disc, and a direct injury to the disc may actually be less. So the net overall conclusion by this is that in a burst fracture, where there is no posterior column injury, when there is no neurological deficit, conservative treatment gives as good a result with fewer complications, and to do more when less is sufficient is not a good surgical sense. So that is the conclusion what we'll have to do. But then when we go to conferences, 
there is a lot of people who are showing gross increase in kyphosis. And why does that happen? Now, this is a very good uh, example. You can see little kyphosis, and this looks like you can treat it conservatively, but this is what has happened after one year of treatment. Now, do you take it as a failure of conservative treatment? No. It is actually a poor judgment and a wrong diagnosis to treat it as a burst fracture because you can see here that the posterior column is completely disrupted. So this is not a burst fracture. This is actually a B type of injury according to the AO spine classification. So all the patients who are having very poor results and also who are having an increase in the length of the uh, collapse and an increase in kyphosis are actually problems of B type of classification fractures which have been wrongly diagnosed as A type of classification. So always, whenever you see an injury like this, you do a stress x-ray at the time when the patient is having lesser pain and make sure that the posterior column is not given off. And if it is, then the best time to treat it is at that time to do a fusion over here. Now, what about post-traumatic kyphosis? So if there is an increase in kyphosis, as this study has very clearly shown, poor results with post-traumatic kyphosis and pain were common after flexion distraction injuries and missed PLC injuries, posterior ligament complex injuries. So always pay attention to the posterior column and the posterior ligament complex rather than just looking at the anterior column. Now, how do you assess a posterior column injury? And you know, you have so many of these various classifications. And in fact, the last two classifications by the Tilix by Vaccaro and then the Slip by Vaccaro actually put a lot of emphasis on the posterior column uh, injury. But the currently uh, mostly followed and the most valuable morphological classification is the AO spine thoracolumbar fracture classification and the classification depends upon image. Now, A fractures are fractures only injuries which are involving the anterior column. B is when there is an extension of injury to the posterior column, but there is no dislocation. And C is a frank dislocation. So all C type of injuries, whether they have neurological deficit or non-neurological deficit, they are frankly unstable and they require uh, fixation. Whereas the B type of injuries, you must not miss it because A can be treated conservatively, but B has to have a surgical compression. So always look at the posterior column and this is very, very critical. Now, for identifying the posterior ligamentous complex injury, you require an MRI because when you see here, you take an MRI. In the X-ray, you may miss it, but in the MRI, there is always a gross signal intensity change at the interspinous ligament and also in the supraspinatus, uh, supraspinous ligament, and that gives you a good idea. Uh, if you don't miss it, then these type of poor results will not happen because uh, then if you have a ligamentous complex injury, then it will always collapse. Now, the confusion is that if you have a stable looking fracture, there is no posterior column injury, but just if you see a minor increase in this uh, signal intensity, do you need to operate? No, you can wait and watch, you carefully watch them, you know that they are at risk for a collapse, but this is one of the patients who just had an increase in signal intensity, and you can see we have treated him conservatively with very good results, and he's a heavy manual uh, laborer. So just a small increase in the signal intensity on the posterior side, without a clear evidence of an uh, increasing gap in the spinous process or a rupture of the supraspinatus ligament, then that doesn't mean that you need to uh, operate on these patients. So two problems, role of MRI and can you identify a PLC without MRI? Now, we looked at uh, clinical picture and x-rays, CT scans and MRI, and this was a part of the AO spine study. And we found that by plain radiology, in 62% of the patients, you can attain the correct classification. Wherever there was a doubt when you do a CT, 
then there was an improvement by 26%. And only in very few patients, you actually required an uh, MRI. So the CT was very, very sensitive in identification of posterior wall fractures, posterior arch fractures, and also PLC injuries. So you can see this patient appears to be a, a type of injury like A1 or A2. But here you can see that when you take a CT, you can see that there is a posterior wall fracture, which cannot be seen in uh, uh, ordinary X-ray. And when you take an MRI, you can also see that there is a posterior ligamentous uh, injury. Now, that's why in 68.5% of uh, fractures for plain X-rays, you can see, and this will be this was increased to 79.3%. Uh, when you did not change after the MRI. So this is very important. So MRI changed decision only in one of the 31 patients. And so you have to be uh, careful that MRI needs to be utilized only wherever it is necessary. So in these patients without a neurological deficit, what are the other gaps in knowledge that we have? And this depends upon the effect of canal compromise on outcomes, on the timing of surgery, and the role of uh, other. Uh, one of the major controversies, what is the role of canal compromise in your decision? And is surgery required to improve canal dimensions? Now we know that when you have a burst fracture, some of the large fragments encroach upon the canal. And that is quoted as one of the main indications for uh, surgery. But if the patient is already neurologically intact, then there is no need for that as an indication because that the patient remains neurologically intact is evidence that whatever the degree of compromise, it was not sufficient to cause damage. So there is no additional reason that because there is a compromise in the canal, that you have to go and operate. There was a fear that this impinged fragment may actually cause canal stenosis and it may actually deteriorate the symptoms. But this is not really true because in fact, the opposite has been proved because the spinal canal remodels with time. You can see that this fracture, where it looks like there is a very gross uh, canal compromise, over a period of time, you can see that there are many articles in literature which have shown that body reabsorbs these canal fragments and then the canal reforms over a period of six months. So it is also now proved that paralysis occurs at the moment of injury and is not related to the position of the fragments of the fracture on subsequent imaging. And surgical clearance does not affect the neurological outcome. So, you know, what you really need to understand is that because there is a small fragment into the canal, if the patient is neurologically intact, that is not an indication for removal. Because this was when we were residents, we were always taught that this fragment must be removed, whatever is, and, and that is the reason uh, anterior approach came into uh, uh, practice because by anterior approach you can do really a good you know. So uh, this is no longer true that 20, greater than 25% of canal compromise requires surgery. If the patient is intact, however much there is a canal compromise, it is not an indication in surgery. Now, will you do an anterior surgery or posterior surgery? Now, this is what is standard treatment in many countries in Europe, especially in Germany. They believe that you should do a posterior surgery, but also an anterior surgery where the canal uh, is cleared and then a large cage is placed in the uh, front. Of course, the results are good, but however, this is too much of surgery which is not required in fracture at all. So because <coughs> when you do an anterior surgery, you have the advantage of a better canal clearance, but you know it is a longer surgery. It has more complications, more blood loss, whereas posterior is very easy and there is a lack of pulmonary, visceral and vascular structures 
and there is an ability to extend uh, fixation also. <coughs> and also, if you actually do a very good surgery by posterior approach itself, by the placement of the screws, uh, screws and by actually restoring the lordosis, you can see that from a 47 degrees of kyphosis, you can actually restore uh, the lordosis very clearly. So anterior surgery is not required. And in my practice, almost always, I have always tackled any severity of fracture by posterior surgery rather than doing an anterior surgery. Now, this topic has been covered by many trials. There has been seven RCTs and three controlled clinical trials comparing between anterior versus posterior. And again, it was found that there are no differences in terms of neurological recovery, return to work, complications, kyphosis between the two groups. But anterior approach takes a longer operative time. It has a higher cost and a greater blood loss and more complications. So there is no necessity to do an anterior surgery for any of these patients. And most of them can be treated by posterior approach itself. Now, again, this is a very good comparison and they did a good meta-analysis and they found in the burst fracture subgroup, operative times were significantly shorter and perioperative blood loss was less in the posterior approach than the anterior approach. So overall, now the whole thing is pointing towards a posterior only approach. What about and open versus minimally invasive if you are doing posteriorly. Now, percutaneous group without fusion, earlier pain relief and functional improvement. So they said that if you can treat these by uh, minimally invasive approach, the results are as good as uh, doing an open surgery. So over a period of time, I can foresee that in the future, there will be more and more of minimally invasive percutaneous screw uh, technique coming into burst fractures. Lastly, what is the value of a load sharing classification, uh, which actually says that if your score is more than seven, then you must do an anterior surgery because the anterior column or the bone is completely crushed, burst, and also uh, moved away. Now, the reason why they said that you should do an anterior uh, surgery when you have a score of more than seven is because of the high incidence of uh, implant failure and the further collapse of the anterior structure. But this has been also overcome by a small change in technique. When you are doing a surgery for a patient with a severe burst fracture, where the load gains uh, load sharing classification score is more than seven, you need to do two modifications. Number one, you should not distract the column. So when you distract the column, you will find that the void in the anterior column becomes more and then the fracture does not heal. So you just place the patient prone and whatever is the restoration of the lordosis, you will find that the spine almost comes back to normal uh, sagittal contour and then you fix it as it is without distraction and you should use the index level screws. This is a very simple and great modification because in more than 85% of the patients, you can use the two stridal screws, only you'll have to use smaller size screws of 35 millimeters. And once you use the index level screws, your uh, incidence of complications become very, very low. Now, let me show uh, two good examples. Here you can see that there is a complete burst fracture and you can see that the kyphosis is there, but we have treated completely by posteriorly, but you have seen that we have not distracted the fragments so that the body has not opened. And we have also used an index shaped screws and you can see that the long-term results are very, very good. There is no need to distract and restore the height of the fractured fragment. That is the uh, 
basic important thing that we have to know it. Now again, in this case, you can see the load sharing classification is eight, which means previously we thought that we should do an anterior surgery to support the column. But here again, you can see we have used the same principle, not distracted the uh, bone and also restored the height of the fractured vertebra and also use the index screws. And you can see that there is an excellent result, very good uh, consolidation. So there is no need, uh, the indications for doing an anterior surgery is becoming much and much lesser. So what about fusion? Fusion was supposed to be an integral part of surgery, but that we also now know that it is all right to just fuse as the bone is and the bone will nicely heal. And then there is no need to add additional bone grafts or any other fusion techniques over there. So overall, short segment screw fixation without fusion is actually giving an excellent uh, result over here. And as in these studies uh, from China have shown that the long-term results of just stabilization of the fracture, either by an open or minimally invasive technique, without addition of bone grafts, and they think there are excellent results uh, by this group. So if you are designing on non-operative treatment, what is the ideal treatment? And in these non-operative treatments, I mean, they did a lot of uh, studies and they found that the presence of neurological deficit is not an absolute contraindication for conservative treatment. But you know, in actual practice, uh, in, at least in our center and for myself, if there is a complete neurological deficit without instability, then we would still discuss with the patient that uh, we are not very sure of how much the neurology will improve because of surgery, but we would be tempted to actually give the benefit of doubt to the patient and actually cause a, uh, a decompression and stabilization. So we need uh, a lot more studies to show that what is the best form of treatment when there is a, a neurological deficit and that is uh, being done by the burst fracture equipoise study of the knowledge forum trauma in uh, Eospine. So in conclusion, uh, there are very strong indicators and principles in the treatment of burst fractures. Uh, in the obviously stable A group, there is no need for surgery. In the obviously unstable group of C, where there is a fracture dislocation, surgery is definitely required. Whenever you think that it is a A fracture of only the anterior column, make sure that you carefully look at the posterior column to make sure that it is not a B type of injury. If there is an involvement of the B column, posterior column, either in the bone or in the facet joint level, or there is a serious disruption of the supraspinous ligament and the interspinous ligament, then obviously a surgery will be required. If these indications are not there, conservative treatment gives as good a result as an operative treatment, both in short term, mid term, and also in long term. Not only they give equal results, but also the incidence of complications and the implant related complications and implant related pain and the need to do a research when there is an implant related problem is very much less. Most of the fractures, almost I would say 98% of the fractures nowadays can be treated by posterior only surgery and the indications for anterior surgery is becoming lesser and lesser. Minimally invasive surgeries are giving equally good results as open surgery, as it has been well proved that fusion techniques are not necessary for uh, burst fractures. Once the bones heal and the ligaments heal, then the patients have very good relief of pain. So overall, we should not be too aggressive and only operate whenever it is necessary because the common surgical dictum is to do more when less is good is not good surgical sense. So thank you again for this great opportunity to be uh, with all of you. 
Uh, I'm sorry that I'm not able to join you in person on live due to some um, personal family emergencies uh, over there. But I would uh, greatly appreciate um, any questions that is there. I would really uh, take the opportunity to answer them uh, individually. And also I thank the organizers for giving me this great opportunity to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Ashok, are you listening? Yeah, that is the end of the talk. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, our video is not working yet. Yeah, that was the end of the talk. We can post. Okay. Oh, okay. Now, please start our videos. Yeah, you can start your videos. No, it, uh, it, it, it is saying a, that uh, uh, host, host has it. Uh, in the meantime, sir, I would like to. Okay. Um, now, may I uh, request our expert panelist to ha have any queries regarding the excellent talk of uh, by the Professor Ashekran? Because more or less the dictum is clear: if we have no neurological deficit and the fracture is stable, we should not over enthusiastically do the surgery. And uh, because long-term results of surgery and the conservative management is more or less same in the stable sort of fracture. Uh, Dr. Sanjay, would you like to yeah. uh, ask something or put in... some comment on the... No, no, it's, it's always a treat to listen to Dr. Rajeshekar and he explains everything well and clearly clarifies everything. But he has very categorically said that uh, most of his cases he is dealing from the posterior side. Uh, what are the indications or what are the cases where there will be a necessity of anterior uh, exposure? I can have an answer from spinal surgeons of our, our Dr. Khatri can explain on that. that what, his take, what is his take on okay. uh, anterior fixation and which cases would like to go for anterior fixation? Okay, uh, thanks very much. And um, when I was training, uh, as Dr. Raj said, we used to do a lot of anterior work. And uh, more and more, uh, we are moving away from interior work. Uh, you might remember there was a device called Canada device, which was, which was a Japanese system. And I was trained to fix fracture anteriorly, but that has more or less, uh, more or less um, gone. The last anterior surgery that I did was for a post-traumatic kyphotic deformity where we had to correct the deformity and uh, it was done because if you look at the initial x-rays, um, the posterior ligamentous complex injury was missed. And therefore this, this lady, she was a young parachutist and uh, she uh, went into quite a significant painful kyphosis. It was a fracture of L1 vertebra, so we had to go from the front, take the diaphragm down, uh, put, um, do a corpectomy, put a cage on, and uh, this lady had very bad intercostal nerve root pain that took almost three to six months to settle down. So for all practical purposes, we have moved away from anterior surgery, and I can't remember doing any anterior surgery in the last three or four years now. Dr. Varun, your uh, take? I think that would be, uh, in my practice, it would be a question of biomechanics. How bad is the anterior support and how much you need to augment it anteriorly? So you have two options. Either you go long posterior or you need to put a anterior uh, uh, some support. Now, on the other hand, uh, anterior surgery doesn't necessarily mean an anterior approach. We have to understand that. We can still construct the anterior column right from the posterior approaches. Maybe it MIS or maybe open surgery where we take out the pedicle and put a cage anteriorly. So sound biomechanics does not need to uh, take a back seat in lieu of an approach. That is what I would like to highlight in this. 
and if the disc space has fused then you need a very good view from the front and then you do traditional anterior approach now this um, this i put more cages uh, in the front for metastatic spinal cord compression now because if you go for mscc it's actually quite easy because the vertebral body is already sort of eaten away by the tumor and then all you need to do is to scoop the tumor out and put anterior cage from posterior approach as um, as as you were saying so i think what, what is important is that every patient needs to be seen individually and we need to take into consideration biomechanics the clinical feature and expectation i equally have patient with kyphotic deformity who are in pain but they chose to leave things alone rather than to go for surgery so it is all about expectation management biomechanic symptoms and uh, and uh, and add all that with the clinical evidence that we have to come to a clinical decision making you know uh, i have seen the uh, uh, dr raj shekran's uh, surgery that uh, he put the screws in the fractured vertebra as well yeah. what is the opinion of panel that uh, what it's is the advantage is it's a know? very good technique it's yeah. a very good technique it is very simple and um, i think the key is that i think dr raj shekhar has already said that you don't need to put two screws you can just put one screw on one side and uh, the screw needs to be to be shortened we are doing more and more of them and uh, we find that what used to be a traditional collapse so classical example would be a t12 vertebra we'll put two screws in t11 and two sp- two screws in l1 and then after 6 months you find that the spice screws and plate the fracture goes into kyphosis um it takes extra 10 minutes to put this index screw and it makes massive difference um i think this is one of the thing that we have adopted in our clinical practice where small investment at the time of surgery has made a very significant difference in the long term outcome how difficult to put the screw in the fracture the pedicle it's not difficult at all yeah it's not difficult at all because in most of the fracture you will find that either on the right or the left side pedicle would be intact okay and remember this old concept of force nucleus so the grip that uh, that a pedicle screw gets is at the junction of pedicle and posterior vertebral body and in most of the cases you will get a good grip and any vertebral any screw which is inside the vertebral body beyond that actually doesn't add a lot to the biomechanics Dr. Shah and Dr. Varun, your opinion. So one point of caution, though, like you rightly pointed out, one should be aware that you don't put the screw in the fractured pedicle. If the fracture line is going through the frac uh, through the pedicle, and it's a burst pedicle, uh, one should not try it because you might malposition it, and as it is, it will not have any hold in it. 
so uh, have a good look at your radiology before attempting this technique although it is very good and uh, we do it regularly and uh, if the pedicle is intact then it is just like putting any other pedicle screw and okay. that is one thing which you should be aware of sure Yeah, as per the CT, that if the pedicle is intact, that you can put either on the both side or same side. Uh, body is not required at all because there is a condition that is correct. Body is uh, totally bare. So only the pedicle that we need to see in the CT that it is intact, and we can put this in the CT. And so, can I can I ask question because uh, you know I worked in India, I worked in Sabda Jung with uh, Katie long time ago. and i work in uk and i think there is a, there's a difference in the fracture pattern in uk and in yeah. and in india and we i think in india you see far more uh, difficult and uh, high energy injury and also uh, often neglected injury which we don't see so question to varun and um, shah you know we almost always find a pedicle through which we can put a screw in in this situation the index screw in in your experience when you see this patient what proportion of patient that you see where you find that both the pedicles are gone and you got put can't put screws in and in that case do you go for a longer yeah. longer fixation so uh, sir actually uh, i'm glad that you brought this up actually just 3 days back i did a case of a fracture of the spine where on the right side the pedicle was uh, uh, fractured so it is uh, at least one you generally tend to find one sound pedicle in which you can put the screw but on the other hand you should also be aware that you are not trying to put it in a fractured pedicle and uh, that happens uh, i think around 20 25% of the time mm. that you have a fracture involving the pedicle going through the pedicle and the pedicle is not sound enough especially in a fracture dislocation kind of a scenario or uh, uh, maybe a chance fracture kind of a scenario where the uh, fracture line is running through the posterior column so like uh, uh, sir uh, showed in his presentation if the posterior and the middle uh, the posterior column is not involved at all in the fracture then it's a type c fracture uh, sorry type uh, uh, a fracture and then you can safely assume that the uh, pedicles are intact and you can uh, you know try to uh, put the screws in the pedicle so classifying the fracture becomes much more important and it is uh, at the uh, type b which is a missed kind of a fracture you are assuming it is to be a wedge compression but actually it is a three column injury that is where you may land up into trouble and you should be aware of that manoj one more question that uh, about distraction distraction at all not to be done or minimal distraction just to get gain the height and uh, in the bust fracture basically so you know we used to distract and we used to put bone graft into the vertebral body we used to do a lot of work for um, trying to restore lordosis and uh, or, 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 or the kyphosis where the fracture is and then we used to see failures so now we go for positional distraction so you position the patient on montreal mattress and whatever gentle correction you get you accept it and that doesn't seem to make any difference in the outcome at all i think i think the way we have moved since we were registrar together kd and then we were training and we have evolved uh, i think we have moved more and more to do things more simply than what we were doing before and um, and making it simple doesn't seem to have made any difference in the outcome in fact it has made things easier and therefore potentially less complication so keep it simple is um, i don't know what uh, varun and uh, shah would want to say with that shah and varun please yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, i would like to ask the one thing that can you because we are working in india and we are going to uk right now so what is the role of conservative how what is the protocol for giving conservative management what kind of brace that you can how uh, uh, by what time you are mobilizing the patient because i as i saw in the Uh, in the lecture of the doctor that I took in fact that is saying that it's so costly in the conservative treatment in the depression part so how how is it different from our country i would just like to uh, find out sir. so why this so, has been shown by doctor that it was so costly so what you yeah, i'm i'm really glad you brought this uh, brought this up and uh, uh, 
uh, and I wanted to discuss this in one of our, in one of our uh, in one of our um, uh, CBDs. So my view is that fracture is either stable or unstable. Now we got a very good radiology department, and uh, if you ask for an MR scan, uh, we'll get MR scan usually in a day or two. So essentially, almost all of fractures get CT scan and MR scan, and I take on board. Uh, Dr. Raj Fakran's comment that CT scan is as sensitive and specific to pick up PLC as MR scan. Now, if the fracture is stable, then we get this patient up and about straight away. The next question is that, what is the role of the brace? I personally don't think so, brace does anything at all. You know, there are papers after papers after paper which have shown uh, that uh, Brace can prevent kyphosis on a shorter term, but on a longer term, it makes no difference to the outcome. I do use brace, and uh, I use brace mainly to, for the lack of a better phrase, uh, to, to brace the head rather than the back and to reassure the patient and to reassure the nurses in the ward and uh, to get the patient out of the hospital. We get them out pretty quickly of the hospital and a lot of these patients we don't admit. We see them in ED, we, we, have, we have a special, we have a clinic, um, rapid access clinic. We bring them to the clinic and we mobilize them. So trunk control, pain management, plus minus brace and get them out of the hospital. Thank you. Sir, one more thing uh, that I would like to ask. Sir. Where will you? Can you? I can't hear you very well. Can you? Your, your volume is uh, very you, low. You, yeah, your mic is. I think. Yeah. I might. I might be missing things. Yes. So one more thing that uh, what is the role of this? Uh, uh, that right now what we are seeing that a few people have started doing cementing in cases of these unstable bus. Uh, this unstable bus. Uh, stable bus fracture. Some unstable bus fracture. So is there any role for cementing or doing transverticular bone grafting for this fracture or do you just need to fix this fracture and just go away? Okay. Do you prefer to do so, this bone grafting or cementing? In cases of okay, I think I'm, I'm really glad you brought this up. And um, I think perhaps we need to meet again to talk about this uh, elderly group uh, with, with fracture. So about uh, five or 10 years ago, we were doing a lot of uh, percutaneous cement augmentation. We started to do them in elderly people. We started to do kyphoplasty and then we moved to vertebroplasty. If you look at evidence, there is a large paper which is, uh, which is uh, multicentric and they've shown that the result of kyphoplasty is better than the result of vertebroplasty, which is better than the result of non-operative treatment in this fracture. So I'm talking about elderly group and I'll come to younger Younger, younger, younger population in a second. However, if you look at this uh, this paper, it was funded by Kaifo. He used to sell Kaifoplasty, and there are multiple trials which have shown that uh, vertebroplasty or Kaifoplasty for trauma. I'm not talking about tumor. It, it has got very good value in tumor. Uh, have shown no long term difference at all. To such an extent that um, there was a national report in UK called Getting It Right First Time Report, Getting It Right First Time Spinal Surgery, and they have uh, banned use of kyphoplasty uh, for elderly fracture. And for any, any uh, vertebroplasty, uh, again, we have to take them through a multidisciplinary meeting and get it approved to the MDTA before we do that. So the number of kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty that we do in my unit has gone down quite dramatically. And in our experience, it made no difference at six months, one year outcome. At one point, we started to put calcium into, into young population, into young, young fractures. And, and as we said, you know, if you look at AO, uh, AO trauma, uh, trauma system, we used to put bone graft in. We stopped doing that all. And it doesn't seem to make any difference at all in the outcome. For cancer, it is completely different, uh, especially breast cancer to do kyphoplasty, vertebral plasty is a very good thing, but not in this group. 
I don't know what is Varun's practice. Uh, you might want to comment on that. I fairly do a few kyphoplasties. To be very frank, in uh, 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 proven pseudo arthrosis in a osteoporotic fracture, when their uh, medical management is not, patient is not responding to it, and I have had good results mm -hmm. in ambulating them early and uh, making them pain free. But so, did you manage to restore the restore the kyphosis? Because I have two patients where we restored kyphosis in kyphoplasty, and in others because they were six weeks, eight weeks down the line with balloon, we couldn't restore the vertebral height and the shape. So, I think three weeks is the uh, sweet spot where you should hit them. Yeah. After six to eight weeks, I don't think uh, there is much mobility in the. Uh, and the difficulty that we face is that, uh, or I face is that, if you see an uh, elderly lady with uh, vertebral BCF, uh, you know that vast majority will settle down in six weeks' time. 90 plus percent will six, settle down in six weeks' time. And those who don't settle down, by that time, it is too late to do kyphoplasty. <laughs> so then what do you do? You do 90 percent unnecessary kyphoplasty. <laughs> To miss that, uh, I agree, two to three weeks is the correct time, okay. is that, uh, it, you know what I'm saying? And and I think that's the beauty of spine. There's so much of unknown <laughs> that we will never have answer to. Dr. Manoj, we have a lot of queries, and I would like to share your few of the cases so that we can have uh, hands-on directly discussions on those cases, and okay. uh, our queries can be settled down, sir. Okay, so do you want me to start the... Yeah, you please, you please start your care, care discussions on thoracolumbar injuries. So give me two seconds. So, right, can you... Okay, can we all see the screen and can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, that's great, okay. So... This is uh, the first case that we have, and this is a 56-year-old builder who was working, fell off her stairs, and I think about, uh, about six steps. He has a long history of low back pain, and he walks into ED with new onset back pain. Uh, no other injury. He was otherwise fit and well. So they did these images. So we got x-ray and we got MR scan. Uh, we haven't got a CT in this case because a lot of patients we jump straight away to MR scan rather than CT scan. So on examination, he was tender over thoracolumbar spine. He was walking around. He had trunk control. He had no blood and bowel symptom and uh, the neurological examination was completely normal. So please, can I ask and get some guidance based on what we have heard from Dr. Rajeshekran, how to manage this fracture? Dr. Sanjay, please. Sir. First of all, I would like to have a classification of this injury. So how old is this injury, Manoj? So this is a fresh injury. This chap walked into ED and okay. then he came to our uh, spinal clinic uh, because the trunk control, they sent him home. They put this brace on. They gave him this brace. You can see that. They gave him this brace and he came to our in uh, clinic about four days after the injury. Four days after the injury. Yeah. I think it looked totally stable injury. Posterior column looks intact. Shah that... and uh, Varun, are you there? Varun? So it uh, appears to be a uh, sir anterior wedge compression or a type A injury as per the uh, spine classification. Uh, the posterior uh, complex seems intact. On the MRI. Yeah. There is a little bit of edema uh, on the uh, D12 or um, two vertebra. We uh, are a little bit of edema posteriorly, if you can see. Yeah, I agree. Because uh, lower, lower down, you can see two levels where there is uh, interior wedge compression. 
uh, some white shadow. Mm. So there must be some soft tissue injury in the posterior column as well. I agree because um, I my view is that uh, my definition of fracture is um, um, a fracture is a soft tissue injury, which incidentally also have some fractures. So when this chap fell from his stairs, he hurt his back, not just vertebral body or spinous process or lamina or pedicle, he hurt his back. And therefore there is an element of injury, but he was walking around, he had, he had good trunk control. His pain was manageable. So would anybody treat him operatively, non-operatively? Brace, no brace. It looks like a stable fracture, so I will prefer to do the conservative management. Uh, I will prefer to uh, get an stress X-ray for this patient if the pain is uh, within limits. Then I would like to take an stress X-ray for this patient so that I can see, uh, so that I can appreciate that the hazmata column is getting open up. Then afterwards, I can decide better. But otherwise, as per MRI and X-ray scan, it looks like a stable injury. I'll, I would like to go for conservative management. Okay, I think that's what we did actually. I'm not sure about this PLC injury in this patient uh, as uh, this is cut is not uh, able to some edema is there, but still I'm not sure whether the PLC is injured or not. So by this chap, this by, by this time this chap is about four days after the fracture. He was walking around, he has good trunk trunk control, pain was manageable. So to my mind, he has actually already proven to me that his spine is stable. And if spine hasn't sort of fallen apart in, 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 in four days time, it is very unlikely that it will fall apart any further. So we chose to treat him non-operatively. And uh, we did a TLIX score. So um, I know Dr. Raj Shekran was talking a lot about AO classification but the slick classification is essentially where you have um, uh, put together AO and Telix classification together. And we tend to use Telix classification in our, in our unit. And we've got this classification stuck onto the wall of the clinic so that people can just see and, and apply it. And uh, when, we, when we applied Telix classification, uh, it was a total three point, which will actually suggest uh, non-operative treatment, and this is what we did with this patient. Is there any question from the participants? Uh, no. That is a panel. panel what, was speaking. Her, what was your protocol of the non-operative treatment, conservative treatment, sir? So trunk control, we mobilized them, we put them on brace for four to six weeks, essentially for comfort, and after four to six weeks, we asked them to wean the brace off. The, 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 the big question is return to work and return to work uh, depends upon their, um, what they do. If, if they're an office worker by four to six weeks, they're back to work. Uh, as far as driving is concerned, as long as they've got full control of the vehicle and they can perform emergency braking, uh, they can go back to driving. If it is heavy manual job, uh, then uh, we advise them for a phase return to work at um, at three months. Uh, we do have spinal specialist physiotherapists who take them through various exercises, essentially trunk control, et cetera, et cetera, and, uh, and they go for phase return to work. So up to a certain extent, uh, we do not have a fixed protocol and we adapt or post-treat post both post brace or post uh, or management plan tailored to individual patients. So uh, which brace do you use, sir? So that's a, that's a very interesting question. So I truly do not believe that a brace will do anything for this patient at all. So we have off the shelf TSLO brace, uh, which is kept in the ward and uh, they cost about 70 pounds each as compared to custom built brace, which is about 350 pound. And we put those brace off 
and the idea is to stop uh, keep this back extended rather than uh, allowing back to flex forward what it does i don't think so it makes any difference at all to me mind my mind brace is more for comfort and reassurance in this fracture rather than to give any true mechanical support to the spine what would varun do in terms of brace and post stop uh, so in my practice uh, as you rightly said even i don't believe in braces mm-hmm. but i tend to give them uh, sometimes even after surgery and uh, in cases like these just so that the patient remembers that they have yeah. to you know take care uh, and not be very adventurous because we find these indian patients they think the surgery has happened or even if you are doing it conservative that they can back to uh, go back to their work and do all sorts of adventures like lifting heavy weight weight or Uh, you know uh, sacks of potatoes on their head and so so on and so forth so just that he remembers that they have to take precautions for a while that is my intention of giving it to them so my problem is exactly the opposite varun <laughs> and that's a very interesting thing and maybe we can do a study uh, on on post op rehab and return to work in similar fracture in uh, in uk and india because uk is a socialist country government will feed everybody so if you break your spine you got absolutely no uh, often sorry often you don't have incentive to go back to work because you know the society will look after you so what we find people who are self employed uh, tend to go back to work sooner mm-hmm. as compared to people who are employed and i remember very well me and kd we used to work in subjang subjang hospital and we have put hundreds and hundreds of external fixator in tibi at night and next morning we used to uh, send them home because we had to vacate our emergency room and within a week or two these people will go back to work because if they don't work they don't get paid and they can't eat whereas in a in a socialist country like uk they have been off for, off for three months, six months, nine months, twelve months. So, I th- I think you've raised a very important uh, important point, and uh, it might be a very interesting observation study to see return of work pattern potato sack versus um, versus uh, couch potato and television and pizza to see what is the difference. I think that would be something very interesting to look at. Uh, I think Manoj, you have a socialist country and we have socialist welfare country, and I think we have a lot of uh, uh, related <laughs> relatives to support these patients, and they take yeah. rest for for three yeah. months as well, and they don't move at all. There are a lot of relatives there; they, they take care yeah. of these guys. Yeah. Doctor Man, Doctor Manoj, a lot of welfare. Yeah. Doctor Manoj, should we take it that there is no use of braces in these spine fractures? I think the way yeah. I've said it that you know brace the as and I think Varun will probably agree with me and um, is, is that uh, I don't think so brace provide any structural support to the spine, but it does remind the patient and people around them that look there's something around your around your uh, spine uh, so there's a problem with your spine and uh, therefore be careful. I had a patient last. couple of weeks ago i was on call and i had this elderly woman with stable fracture of her spine and uh, she just won't leave the bed and we can't send her home we gave her a brace her daughter was happy she was happy she felt her spine was supported and she started to mobilize with physiotherapy and off she went home so i braced a head rather than a spine for the lack of lack of better phrase regarding So what my take regarding braces is that we also give braces to our patient, and even in the post-op patient, we mobilize this patient with a brace. So what we feel like braces only for the pain relieving purpose, not for structural support something like that. Whenever whatever the patient feel like, but it's up to the comfort of the patient so that we can mobilize the patient with the help of brace. And as soon as the patient is able to tolerate the pain, we can take off this brace. Correct. in your conservative protocol how long uh, do you allow them to have a bed rest or you allow them to go to, the, to their work directly so no bed rest at all so they're stable or unstable if they're stable fracture they are seen by physiotherapist and they are out of bed straight away within the limits of pain so no bed rest 
Uh, if a patient requires prolonged bed rest, then it's an unstable fracture, and I would discuss role of surgery to stabilize a fracture. Uh, return to work very much depends upon their social status, whether they are self-employed or not, whether they are office workers sitting in front of a computer, or whether they've got a manual task. Uh, as a rough rule of thumb for office worker, it is six weeks, and for heavy manual job, it is about uh, three months when we tell them to go for phase return to work. In, Thank you, Doctor. In, in, uh, in unstable fractures also, uh, you will ask them to work, uh, work uh, stand and work? At unstable work, fracture. Or you will want to they give them bed rest for some time. Unstable. So if it's if an unstable fracture, if an unstable fracture, sorry? If we hardly conservatively have, for some reason or other. I can't remember. Well, I have currently, I have got one unstable fracture on bed rest. And the reason why she's on bed rest, because she's in ITU, she has got bilateral pneumothorax. Her BMI is 38 and she's intubated. And to operate on that woman would be a nightmare. So <laughs> we'll cross the bridge um, if she survives. But otherwise, uh, I had one patient about a year ago who did not want it to take the risk of surgery for unstable fracture. And uh, I had a good chat with him and uh, the risk of person staying in bed rest in terms of deep bed thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, et cetera, et cetera outweighs uh, the risk of somebody having surgery. So almost uh, all my patients, apart from these two examples that I can remember, all unstable fracture had surgery. And uh, if surgery was uncomplicated and I had good grip on with the, with the pedicle screws, um, uh, we, we mobilized them uh, ASAP. Malu, there is a question from the audience that uh, in the patient, the early patient, do you go for uh, serum electrophoresis, myeloma uh, workup and uh, bone density and other uh, things apart from MRI or you just... Uh, that's ICD? actually, that's that's very important. That's very, very important. Dr. And, Dr. Uh, Mukesh Shrastha and Dr. Vikas Trivedi is asking this question here. Yeah. So Vikas and Mukesh, thank you very much for this very, very, very good question. And uh, this is actually bringing us into this, uh, this arena of, um, of, um, of um, insufficiency looking fracture in elderly and diagnosis of osteoporosis is by exclusion. So any patient that comes to your clinic whom you think has got osteoporotic wedge compression fracture, you have obligation to do full blood count ESR, CRP, uh, serum electrophoresis, et cetera, et cetera, to ensure that you're not dealing with multiple myeloma because uh, osteoporosis and multiple myeloma can present with very similar picture. And we had patient with plasma cytoma who was thought to be osteoporotic wedge compression fracture. Uh, bone density scan, well, it doesn't need to be done acutely. Uh, we usually write to GP uh, to arrange uh, a bone density scan. And uh, the treatment for bone density scan is done by GP, not by us. But absolutely right, as somebody with a, with a fracture that looks osteoporotic fracture, uh, you need to rule out malignancy, you need to rule out metabolic disorder, and then make the diagnosis of osteoporosis by exclusion. And they do absolutely require treatment for osteoporosis. I do think at time that I tell them that uh, uh, this fracture is a blessing in disguise because we picked up osteoporosis, we can treat osteoporosis and therefore prevent hip fracture, which we know has got fairly high mortality. They're also asking about the teriparatide and other osteoporotic treatment. Uh, is it working in these patients? Such as? The teriparatide. Yeah, so that is, da that is done, uh, done by general practitioner and they follow WHO guidelines. Okay. So we get bone density scan done and it is either normal or osteopenia or osteoporosis. The WHO guideline for osteopenia is uh, vitamin D and calcium. And the first line drug for proven osteoporosis is alendronic acid. 
So the number of medication which are used in UK are very limited. So Dr. we don't Dr. have... And Dr. Tripathi, I think uh, you should introduce the formally the Dr. Manoj Khatri, and we should have our second talk on this pandalysis now, sir. I think there, there is one more case. Uh, but we are getting yeah. short of time, sir. It's already. Okay, uh, let's uh, go uh, ahead with the lecture uh, and then. Lecture, then. we can discuss later on. Thank you, uh, Manishi. I think uh, Dr. Manoj Khatri is an excellent and passionate teacher, as you have seen. For uh, last one hour, and he is very tough examiner as well for the FRCS and uh, other uh, courses in the UK and Ireland. He is the AO Council member of uh, AO Spine uh, for the UK and Ireland. Right now, he is a consultant orthopedic spinal surgeon uh, in the Lancashire Teaching Hospital. He is the associate director out there and uh, he is uh, uh, working in the Preston Royal Hospital. I think uh, his CV is about 8 to 10 uh, pages large. I think uh, I will take half an hour to read his CV, I think. And it took 30 years to reach out that uh, he is uh, as an excellent teacher, excellent uh, orator. And now you can listen him from his mouth as well. Go ahead, Dr. Maroj. So, Katie, it is so nice of you to invite you for to this 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 meeting and this this panel and um, i have known you since we were senior resident in southern hospital as little doctors running around here and there fixing broken bone and uh, uh, i have a very fond memory of what we did together in subdajang and it is so nice to see you and, uh, and it is so nice of all the panelists and uh, people from UP Orthopedic Association to invite me to come to this, uh, this, this really nice forum uh, to, to share my thoughts. Um, we had excellent talk by Dr. Raj Shekran and he has covered quite a few important issues and now we are moved to completely different, uh, different arena of spondylolisthesis. Spondylolisthesis is a condition that fascinates me and we will, I will share my thoughts, whatever it is worth after this. So I work in Royal Preston Hospital, as, uh, as you said, this is, uh, Preston is in uh, North of England and um, uh, we have excellent motorway link, but we are fortunate to live in front of nature. So seaside and uh, these hills and, and, and mountains are within 30 minutes reach uh, from Preston and I'm a nature level. So uh, anybody who would, who would want to come to us would be very welcome. And I would love to show you the nature around where we live. So. Uh, coming to this uh, topic of, uh, of uh, can I just move this slightly? Yeah, coming to this uh, business, I think what I would like to do is to uh, talk about uh, the definition of spondylolisthesis and epidemiology. I would want to spend some time on classification and then I'll digress slightly to high-grade spondylolisthesis when we talk about uh, classification. And uh, then we can talk about uh, clinical features and principles of management of low grade uh, isthmic spondylolysis. Uh, I have not displayed any of my real patients' uh, images in in this talk, so I'm not uh, I'm not in breach of uh, patient conf confidentiality. So it's not moving. Can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear. Okay, I don't know why my slide is not moving. Okay, it's moving, sir. Okay, right. Okay, so, uh, so most of you would know the word spawn means spine, lysis means break, and lysthesis means slippage. So, uh, spondylolisthesis literally means uh, that there is a slippage in the spine. Uh, there are a variety of causes of slippage, but the main thing that we will be talking today about um, break in the pars interarticularis um, uh, that causes a spondylolisthesis. 
And we know biomechanically, pars is the weakest part of the, of the spine. So there are two diagrams here. One is the normal spine. And here you can see there's a break in the pars intraarticularis. And because of that, L5 vertebra has shifted forward. And as a result, the L5 neuroforamina is compromised, and which is where you get uh, neurogenic pain from. So the commonest level of spondylolysis is seen in L4, L5, L5S1, more common in boys. It is never seen in newborn. So isthmic spondylolysis is not seen in newborn. It is not seen in dogs. It is not seen in those who have never walked. So I think this is the price we are paying because we have decided to walk differently from our cousins, i.e. dogs and giraffe and tiger and elephant, and we walk on two, we, we extend our back and therefore we are, we are we have this condition, which is unique to, to us. So there are phenotypic and genotypic um, influence on spondylolisthesis. So if one of you have spondylolisthesis, it's quite likely your family member would have spondylolisthesis. It is quite common in Inuit, where you see 30 to 50%, 30 to 40% of Inuit will have this condition. In Caucasian, it is reported to be in six to seven percent of population. However, if you do CT scan, the, the prevalence increased to 11 percent. So I think this is a condition which is sort of underdiagnosed. It has been said that it is gymnastics and fast-paced cricket bowler where you most commonly get spondylolysis. Now, there's an Italian study that looked into um, their, their Olympic, uh, potential Olympic athletes. And they found that the prevalence of spondylolisthesis or past defects was 14%. And interestingly, diving was the sport that was most commonly associated with spondylolisthesis or spondylolysis along with wrestling and weight bearing so traditional gymnastic was only 16%, whereas, um, whereas diving was 40%. So I thought uh, this, was, this was interesting. And again, if you see in diving, people will hyperextend uh, their back. So this is a Wilson's classification, and most of you would be aware of Wilson's classification, and therefore I'm not going to go into any further detail of this classification. I will do, um, do, do talk very briefly about dysplastic and then we will focus on isthmic spondylolisthesis. Now, often people use mailing grading system as a classification. Well, mailing system is not a classification, it is a grading of spondylolisthesis which is, which is applicable to, to spondylolisthesis with past defect. And you know, there were four grades and then ptosis was added. So there are five grades of spondylolisthesis. I find it quite difficult in my clinic to classify them between grade one, two, three, or four. So I think for all practical purposes, it should be either a high grade or a low-grade spondylolisthesis, and here there are two examples here. The reason I have put, um, put, uh, put two different spondylolysis, if you look at the top slide, it is L4, L5 spondylolisthesis, and if you look at uh, the, the slope of the, of the disc space, it's quite horizontal, whereas if you look at the bottom slide, you will see that sacrum is tilting quite forward, and in fact, there is an element of dome-shaped sacrum making you wonder whether you're dealing with a dysplastic, uh, dysplastic spondylolysis. But the bottom line is that it is either a low-grade or a high-grade spondylolysis, and that is also applicable in your clinical decision-making process. So often people say dysplastic spondylolysis as a congenital spondylolysis. Well, there's nothing like congenital spondylolysis. Uh, the 
dysplastic spondylolisthesis is as a consequence of congenital abnormality, either to the upper sacral or lower L5 facet joint, they don't have, they don't have any past defect. There is a fundamental difference between um, spondylolisthesis in children and adult. In children, about 20% to one third of uh, children with spondylolisthesis, depending upon which paper you read, will have dysplastic spondylolisthesis and rest will be spondylolisthesis with past defect. Whereas in adult, almost 90% uh, or 98% would be, would be uh, isthmic spondylolisthesis. So therefore, I think the rest of the talk, we will be talking about low-grade aesthetic spondylolisthesis because high-grade spondylolisthesis is entirely a different topic, perhaps for another day. So what I would like you to do is to introduce um, this new classification. It's actually not a new classification. It came about uh, eight or nine years ago. And uh, this is a classification that was... Um, that was devised by, um, by Scoliosis Research Society Spinal Deformity Study Group, which was uh, led by Labelle. And uh, this is one of the paper, which like Vacro's paper on Telix classification that has made a difference in my clinical practice. So I would like to spare some thoughts on this particular classification. And then um, I would like all of you to consider whether in your clinical practice, you would be using this particular classification or not. So what this, this classification is applicable only to L5-S1 spondylolisthesis. It is applicable on sagittal plane. And what this SRS group has said, when you see somebody with a spondylolisthesis, look at the local deformity look at the regional deformity and look at the global deformity and take all of them into consideration into your clinical decision-making. So when you see somebody with a spondylolisthesis, define them, whether that's high or low grade, I don't think so, we're adding one, no. two, three, and four, we don't need to do that. Then the next thing one need to look into is lumbosacral kyphosis. Now, it is known that lumbosacral kyphosis is, uh, is associated with poor health-related quality of life index. There are a variety of ways to, 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 to measure lumbosacral kyphosis. And what I put in the box, sorry, Manish, you're saying something. You're on mute. Minashi, can I carry on? Please continue, sir. Okay, sorry. So of, of the variety of way to measure, measure lumbosacral kyphosis, uh, Dubose's way is the easiest one. Uh, you look at uh, the superior end plate of L5 vertebra, draw a line into the posterior of the sacrum body and, and use that. So keep it, keep it simple. So for local deformity, high grade, low grade, and look at lumbosacral kyphosis. The next thing that one need to do is to look into um, the regional deformity. And we all know about pelvic tilt and pelvic incidus and sacral slope. And this classification take into account pelvic incidence. And I will come back to into more detail. And then you take into consideration the global deformity where you look at CVA or plumb line, whatever, whatever, C7 plumb line, whatever works for you. So any patient with spondylolisthesis, you need to look into local, regional, and global balance of the spine. And this is just the same thing in a slightly bigger, 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 bigger slide. Um, I'm conscious that everybody's watching this onto a screen rather than, uh, uh, rather than on, a, on a, an auditorium where you got a large screen to, to demonstrate this. So remember, pelvic incidence, sacral slope, C7 plumb line, and angle of Dubuset, high and low grade spondylolisthesis. So this is the same information, um, which forms the basis of the treatment. And um, 
what you need is a standing lateral view of the whole spine. And I suggest uh, have a little A4 paper or A3 paper, uh, which you can tell all your juniors on what calculation you expect and stick them into the wall of the clinic so that they don't have to remember this. They can, any person with spondylolysis has come, they get x-rays done and they come with this sort of uh, calculations. And uh, this is what you require to, to come to calculation. And there are, um, SRS has clearly defined uh, what, what constitute adequate and what constitute inadequate uh, uh, standing AP and lateral axis for the spine. But for the purpose of this classification, we'll be looking only into the lateral, lateral, lateral views. So then based on this, this particular, um, using these parameters, uh, the spinal deformity research group came up with this classification. So when you see somebody with L5S1 spondylolysis, remember this is applicable only for L5S1 spondylolysis. You divide them into high grade or low grade. Now with low grade, you look into their pelvic incidence. If it is less than 45, almost always they are on L4, L5 level, although this classification says L5S1. And there it is thought that there's a nutcracker effect. So when as a sports person, you, you hyperextend your back, the inferior facet will hit the, the, the pars intraarticularis and therefore pars intraarticularis will break. Then type two, the pelvic incidence is between 45 degree and 60 degree. And in type three, the pelvic incidence is less than more than 60 degree. And this is the one where you should worry that it can potentially progress. I would uh, then slightly digress into high grade. And after this, I will shut up about high grade. Then in high grade, then again, you look into your global balance, C7 plumb line, and to see whether you got a balanced or unbalanced pelvis. In high grade spondylolysis, pelvic incidence is always more than 60. So in type four, five and six, PI will be more than 60. You look at the standing X-ray and see whether the spine is balanced from C7 plumb line. If the spine is balanced, and the pelvis is retroverted, or if it's an unbalanced spine, then you have to make a clinical decision based on that. So I think this is one classification which has made a difference on my clinical management of this condition. So it might be worth considering to adopt this classification in a clinical practice. So then coming to what are the clinical feature of spondylolysis and uh, maybe we can pick this up in discussion. Um, I see a lot of patients with back pain. We know that uh, the lifetime risk of an individual developing back pain is 80%. And at one point, um, one, roughly one third of the general population will have back pain. So if a patient with spondylolysis has come to you with a back pain, then how do you know that the back pain that the person with spondylolysis has is because of spondylolysis or is it because of, um, of non-specific low back pain, which we all suffer from? The evidence in literature is conflicting. There are two papers. Uh, the paper by Andrade, which was published in European Spine Journal, said, well, there's no association between back pain and spondylolysis, whereas the second paper by Rastad have shown that in manual worker, there is a association between spondylolysis and back pain, by which he means that if you're a manual worker and you've got spondylolysis, you're more likely to have back pain as compared to if you did not have spondylolysis. Then often they come with nerve root pain and that makes life easy. So the spondylolysis is, is in L5S1, almost always, always it is L5 nerve root pain. The pain is a bit different from the pain that you get from, uh, from, uh, from a, a lumbar disc prolapse. It is not that acute pain, it is more 
chronic, it's less severe, and um, almost always L5 and SLR is negative. Because I think when you do SLR, you open up the foramina. You know, there are a lot of things in literature about hand, 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 hamstring spasm and step. I, I don't see them in my clinical practice. And even those few patients of high-grade spondylolysis I have, I couldn't feel a step or hamstring spasm. But again, I would I would love to, to hear from 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 the panelists. Uh, do they see something different in, in, in the subcontinent? So investigation. Uh, this is uh, a classic um, oblique view because it is thought that um, that AP uh, lateral view are not adequate uh, to to look at the past defect. Um, uh, in spondylolisthesis. However, the first line of investigation in our clinic is MR scan. We, we don't, we try not to use x-rays and we rarely use CT scan. There was a paper from Liverpool that looks into specifically and sensitivity of MR scan, CT scan, spec and x-ray. And they showed that MR scan is as sensitive and as specific to pick up past defect as compared to any other modality, and that has also been our experience. So the first line of investigation is MR scan, and then uh, CT scans are uh, are rare, and we do CT scan with liver scan tree if, if we have to quantify the past defect to see whether it is acute or chronic or how much of gap is there. And then, of course, this is a lateral view, uh, and this is uh, this is the uh, this is the action of the whole spine. So if you, see, if you see somebody with a high sacral slope or high pelvic incidence, and we want to look at the global balance, then we proceed to this sort of a long standing film, and you will see uh, it includes from external auditory meatus uh, to the hip joint. Uh, there are various ways to to, to measure uh, global balance. Uh, the, the method that we use is from C7 C from line, but there are other, meth me other method and people have used external audio meters as well. So we just have one protocol for all X-rays for scoliosis. So we already talked about uh, risk of progression and uh, uh, a sacral slope or high pelvic incidence in low grade spondylolysis is, uh, I think does make, make, does make a difference. Uh, because it, there's a lot of sheer force. Um, this is probably more of a discussion topic for, uh, for, uh, for spondylolysis in, in children. So coming to treatment, I have spondylolysis. I have spondylolysis of L4, L5, uh, sorry, L5S1, and it doesn't cause me any trouble. And uh, one day I was operating on a woman with spondylolysis, my spinal fellow, my registrar, and I, we all have, we all had or have L5S1 spondylolysis with pars defect. And three of us have got no problem. And we were operating on this woman. So we do not know why spondylolysis cause symptom in one person and in not other person. But again, we can pick this up on our discussion. So vast majority of people with spondylolysis can be managed just by non-operative treatment. Rest physiotherapy, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. The reason for surgery becomes when they have nerve root pain and you do your imaging, MR scan, CT, or whatever is your practice, and you show that this person has got L5 nerve root pain and there's a significant neuroforaminal stenosis that is causing those symptoms, that makes life much easier for me to, to treat the patient. The, the challenge is those spondylolysis with pure back pain. People do do, do pass defect, uh, pass, pass repair and uh, last, Monday and Monday gone, um, we had a local um, a spinal meeting where we had Dr. Sethi from Seattle and Lester Wilson 
from London to speak and Lester Wilson does loads and loads of pass repair. But if you look at the literature, um, the result of pass repair with variety of technique is fairly inconsistent and the spinal fusion get the most consistent result if you want to go to surgery. So very few pass repair we do. Um, if it comes to surgery, uh, almost often it is decompression and fusion. And uh, the challenge that I find is, uh, especially at L5S1, is to decompress the exiting or L5 nerve root. S1 nerve root usually does not require any decompression. And then uh, you, you perform fusion. Uh, it is fairly controversial that uh, whether you should provide just an uninstrumented fusion, versus technique by bone graft, whether you should perform post fusion and whether you should put a cage in or whether you should go from the front, put a hyperlordotic cage to restore the lordosis, restore the balance, and then go from the back and put screws in. So um, let us look at, um, look at evidence. So Hedlung from Stockholm has published a lot on spondylolisthesis. And um, he has published his paper in Journal of Spine in year 2000, Prospective Randomized Control Trial, Spindix, uh, Aesthetic Spondylolisthesis. Um, very decent number and very high follow-up rate, 98%. And um, on one hand was physiotherapy and on, on the other hand was fusion that included uninstrumented fusion, fusion without, uh, without use of medical screws, just with bone craft. And he showed quite clearly that spondylolisthesis is one condition where the result of surgical treatment are better than non-surgical treatment. So, one of the few conditions where spinal fusion work is aesthetic spondylolisthesis. The controversy is then what type of surgery we should be doing. And um, Hedlund in the same journal, so this was this was first paper and then immediately after that, this is the next paper in, 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 in the same journal. And I would, I would encourage postgraduate students who are doing the MS orthopedics to get this paper out and read them because they, they make interesting uh, reading. So he compared instrumented with uninstrumented fusion for systemic spondylolysis in 18 to 55 year old age group. The number is slightly small, 77, an equal number of people who had pedicle screws with bone graft and other had just bone graft with again, very high follow-up rate. And he showed that actually there was no clinical difference in the outcome whether you open the back, stick some bone graft, or whether you add pedicle screws to it. Very interestingly, he showed that if you use bone graft alone and not use pedicle screws, the radiological fusion is better with bone graft alone. So if, you, if you're trying to achieve radiological fusion, you achieve that better by using bone graft alone rather than instrumented fusion. And again, uh, we can pick, the, pick this up into our discussion and I'll, I'll really value to see what, what practice of my colleagues in this panel are. And then the next big question is that whether you should put a cage in or not. If you ask spinal surgeons, what would you do? Majority of them, including my answer for spondylolisthesis would be to put a cage in. And in fair amount of spondylolysis, I put a cage in. Because I think I get better antibody fusion, I can restore better sagittal balance, and I can open up the L5 neuroforamina to cause indirect reduction. And um, the junctional degeneration is probably less with, uh, with LIF. However, um, the 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 literature is conflicting. Uh, this should have been a separate slide um, that uh, 
when we see patient, if they're male, if they're working, and if they do exercise regularly, and we operate on spondylar less systems, they're likely to have better outcome if they're not working and they're not male and they do less exercise. And the type of surgery seems to have very little influence on the outcomes. So the most important reason for successful outcome is male working who exercise regularly. So in conclusion, I think spondylolysis is quite common and it's more common than what we think. Most of the people are asymptomatic Often symptoms are like that of other common condition that we see uh, in, uh, in, in our clinical practice. The spondylolysis in children is completely different to low-grade spondylolysis, which is completely different to high-grade spondylolysis, and they all needs to be um, treated separately because a separate condition, in my view. Balance is quite important as... Uh, uh, as demonstrated very elegantly by a spinal deformity uh, study group or SIS classification. Majority are treated with non steroidal inflammatory physiotherapy. And uh, this is one condition uh, where surgical treatment have got better um, outcome as compared to non-surgical treatment. And type of surgery is a matter of individual preference. And um, uh, it will be interesting to see what, what my colleagues in this panel have our practice. So we live very closely to this place, Lake District, so um, plenty of nature. So hope I will see you in my part of the world where we can have a little meeting or talk while we are in this beautiful place to talk about spinal conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manoj. Thank you. You are really a great orator, uh, excellent teacher. And uh, I think this lecture was very elaborate and very educative and very extensive on the spondylolysis. But uh, I think uh, we need to hear you on the MGIS as well sometimes in the future. I'm sure we can do that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Any question from the panel and uh, from the chat box? Manishi, just see the chat box. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Manoj, for an elucid and excellent talk. Uh, we wish to have some interactive case discussions also so that we can understand exactly what is the protocol and how we should follow the management of spondylolisthesis. So can I just um, stop sharing the screen and go back to cases? Yeah, yes. definitely. Yeah. Right. Okay. So this is a woman who came to me, I think three years ago, 46 year old paramedic, very fit, keen scare, had no back trouble at all for 12 months duration. She started to have gradual onset low back pain and on a numerical rating scale, it was somewhere between seven to 10. And for six months, she started bilateral L5 nerve root pain, which was more on the right as compared to the left side. And the nerve root pain was between eight to 10 and she has corresponding sensory symptom to a big toe. Uh, she has no bladder and bowel disturbance. And she walked to my clinic with uh, two, she was carrying the ski poles in her hand. And she was already taking cocodamol, naproxen and amitriptyline and was more or less in tears. Uh, clinical examination, um, there was no tenderness over a lumbar spine. SLR was 90 degree. Knee jerk and ankle jerk of violatory present, symmetrical motor examination, even normal power, MRC5 in all the key muscles group of lower limb, including EHN. And she, however, had a dysesthesia in L5 dermatome on both sides. And these are her images. So I've kept two, they're both uh, T2 images and, um, and I put one in the midline and one showing the neuroforamina. So I was wondering if anybody would want to 
share your thoughts with me on this one. So I, I thought that um, the, the disk space has collapsed and I could also see some modic changes in, in the end plate of L5 and S1. And apart from L5 S1, um, rest of the spine was absolutely pristine. Therefore, I think it would be quite reasonable to say that a pain was coming from L5 S1 level. We know that spondylolisthesis can result into, into disc degeneration. So it is only an educated guess that if you would have taken an MR scan probably two years ago, maybe a disc space was better preserved. And if you look at the MR scan on the right-hand side, you can see that the neuroforamina between L5 and S1 is, um, is, um, is affected and you can see L5 nerve root is distorted, which will, <coughs> which will sort of affect with a pain. Was she having any radiculopathy or root pain? Yeah, L5 nerve root pain bilaterally, more on right as compared to the left side. So the cause of pain is, uh, I think, uh, because of the distorted nerve root. And uh, how, because uh, she was having both the sticks, uh, uh, not able to walk in, without the yes, support. So, so six months ago, 12 months ago, she was leading a normal life. She was working paramedics. So 999 ambulance on call would um, would um, treat major trauma on, on road, do CPR, and, and now she's completely disabled uh, with back pain. And this woman came to me with two sticks in her hand and literally crying her eyes out. And um, I was wondering whether there was a non-organic component to her pain, because we see a lot of people with back pain uh, where um, we feel that the symptoms are disproportionate to the pathology. And often that worries me because I can see somebody with MR scan exactly like this, who's got no symptoms at all. So, but it fitted, it fitted with a symptom. She's got low back pain, the modic changes, well, how much you believe in modic change again is another topic for discussion. And you can see her L5 nerve root is distorted and bearing in mind that this MR scan was taken in supine position um, you can imagine if the MR scan was taken on a very, very position, probably L5 nerve root would have been compressed a bit more than what you see on this MR scan. So, uh, sir, do you do flexion extension x-rays for such patients? Well, thank you for asking that. The question is, uh, whether we do flexion extension view or whether we do whether we do uh, standing and lying view. Uh, if you look at the literature, uh, the literature suggests that there's no value to it. Um, and um, um, if the person suggests that the, that he's got instability pain, that when the person is lying in bed and there's no pain, and when the patient gets up, there's a pain, that's the time I do more like standing uh, and lying x-ray rather than flexion extension view. Because with flexion extension view in lumbar spine, you need to have a motion of more than four millimeter to show it is unstable. And four millimeter is a long distance to go before you show instability. Dr. Shah? Uh, we see that there are body changes in the spine and the sugar. The lifestyle of this patient is severely crippled just because of the lysis. As we are saying, that patient was well good for 12 months back. And right yeah. now she is crippled just because of the uh, lysis. And, but uh, as the radiology shows that uh, the L5 nerve root is getting hampered and you have given block for this patient and she is not responding to the conservative management. So definitely she's a candidate for surgery, but uh, definitely yeah. I would like to rule out some more, uh, organic cause 
for this patient if the pain is disproportionate to that pain but correct i'm saying that the nerve is getting blocked and so and the body exchanges are also there so she is a candidate for surgery for her problem i feel like so it is more of the degenerative disc disease rather than the lysthesis uh, Pain, she has a, no, she has a positive effect you can see there's a positive effect on yeah. the on the image on the yeah the, right the, the yeah, yeah you can see the positive effect yeah on the hemorrhage it's quite visible sir. yeah so we we for positive effect we have stopped taking x-rays and ct we just rely on our scan and it, we find it's pretty robust way to demonstrate positive effect so nerve root block versus uh, epidural injection is another another area under the topic of discussion so i gave her a epidural injection i do epidural cramps so i take a i take a two he catheter put them through the sacral hiatus and take it up to l5 s1 and uh, then i put a dyeing i use omnipec 300 and after that i use very low dose of um, canalog and and, and carokin 0.5% so she uh, had no meaningful response from the epidural injection her nerve root pain did not improve and every time she came to my clinic she was in tears and that made me quite nervous um wondering whether this person has got uh, um pain which is which is disproportionate to pathology and that was sort of holding me back um i spoke to her went through informed consent gave her option a right letter to patient at the home address um and to copy them to gp and i write try to write letter in a language that a patient can understand wrote letter to her she came back to me after four weeks she said i've read the letter i've done my research on spondylolisthesis she went to websites which i recommended her to go to and she was asking me all the correct questions so so therefore i added her to my waiting list and uh, performed the operation so this is what i did in 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 this in this woman Well, would you have done anything different, or how would you have dealt with this? Uh, so, actually, hence my question for a flexion X-ray. I just wanted to see the mobility at that side, whether it was slipping further, and maybe just uh, nerve root decompression would have been sufficient. But this is quite a good job, and uh, uh, this jacks up the space, frees the traction on the nerve root, which is the uh, true pathology there causing the radiculopathy. so i am putting more and more screws in s1 where almost all my s1 screws are now bipedicular oh, sorry bicortical is Wait. that what you guys is it what you're doing now yes because with with bicortical screws and giving anterior support with a cage um i think the failure implant failure rate should be much lower but you brought this very interesting um, interesting question because when i went in there you know there was a rattler the loose loose l5 element so i take them out in one piece give it to my nurse and she would chop them and i use them as a bone graft but there is a thought there is a thought among europeans that if you just take the rattler off you've done decompression i don't think so that is the case because uh, the pressure on the nerve root is by superior facet of s1 and you have to decompress underneath that you have to go on to need to decompress it my question to you varun is that is there a role of isolated decompression and not trade all the metal that i've traded here in this condition and do you have any experience in that? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, I do quite a lot of uh, just uh, nerve root decompression also, and endoscopic one at that. Uh, re- uh, only if I find that there is no mobility and the spine itself has auto fused in that place. In mm-hmm. that case, uh, uh, if there is no mobility, the spine is not moving. There is auto fusion there. 
the body itself is trying to you know go towards fusion then i don't feel that there is any role of adding metal to it and causing a fusion in an already stabilized spine so as to say in that case i would probably just uh, you know focus at the uh, freeing the nerve roots but if there is mobility yes i would definitely fuse it after uh, and try to re- reduce as much as possible so what impact it will have on her uh, on a back pain because if you look at her initial clinical, clinical picture her back pain was as bad as the uh, leg pain and when you look carefully a lot of people with lumbar disc prolapse come and tell me they got a back pain and leg pain but when you ask them to point to where is the back pain it is to what a buttock so they don't have any true back pain but this woman she had true axial back pain okay so does what is experience on um, on decompression uh, with uh, with um, with uh, axial with improvement or not of axial back pain uh i'm not sure sir how much uh, 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 that contributes to it and uh, if you are taking care of the rattler i think that should probably take care of the back pain itself uh, mm-hmm. uh, the pseudo arthrotic part at the uh, fracture site itself which is causing that movement and uh, causing a lot of back pain provided the spine anteriorly is quite stable now but if this movement is no doubt about it that i would go about fixing this mm-hmm. Well, in my opinion, I think uh, if the patient is elderly, like uh, 60s and uh, above, I think uh, only decompression uh, can be done. But in the 40s, like the younger patients, yeah. you need to decompress and fix them and uh, fuse them. That is uh, yeah. Yeah. my take on it. Yeah. And as you got the bicortical screw in there, just, just, just go back to this. Uh, can you... Uh, put the sacral screw uh, sacral screw just uh, subcortical or subchondral rather than uh, putting the bicortical that day, that I, area I used... the, the, that area of bone is very strong yeah i i don't know i find often because um, i find often that if you just put screws unicortical screw in sacrum that um, that uh, that the grip is not that good but um, as soon as you go through the anterior cortex so what i do i put a pedicle pedicle probe in feel it and then i put a pedicle probe in again when it hits anterior cortex take a hammer and breach the anterior cortex the worry is that you you got common iliac blood vessels yeah. there haven't you yeah. so um, but the grip when it goes through the anterior cortex you can feel it and the grip is much much better And, uh, on the contrary like l5 is softer bone so why not uh, bicortical in l5 rather than putting the in s1 i've i've not encountered this problem in l5 l5 usually you get a good 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 grip and um, and if you don't then i go l4 um, but usually I, i personally i find that screws and sacrum are often they don't often have good grip and therefore i move more and more to Uh, to to bicortical in S1. So I wanted to show this example because this was quite obvious that this is a bicortical screw. So to answer Dr. Tripathi's uh, question, actually the sacral ala is a little smaller than the L5 vertebra. So you, if you are not doing going for a bicortical screw, you are actually putting in a very short screw. And uh, the other part is, so whenever you put a bicortical screw, one has to take a very lateral to a medial trajectory. and that because uh, the screws uh, because the common iliac then bifurcates to the right and left iliac and you want your screw heads to be in between that bifurcation and not you know impinging on the great vessels so that is one thing which should be kept in mind and uh, that can be quite challenging even no matter how much you dissect uh, it can be quite challenging to have that uh, that sort of a medial medial angulation so that becomes a, a little tricky there but uh, i think uh, without a bicortical sort of purchase you are always jittery that it will back out and it does sometimes even on the table while reducing and uh, also also you can then um, if you if you if you want to have some additional support you can put s2 screws in yes so i i mean she's a young woman so i wouldn't have wanted to breach the si joint so i would stick to about 45 mm screw so essentially then you've got s1 screw which is 
which should be converging, and then you've got S2 screw, which should be which should be diverging, and that tends to give a good good pull out strength. Uh, one more question to Manoj and Varun both that uh, the technical issue is sometimes when you have very fatty lady, obese lady with mm -hmm. uh, a lot of sectoral slope, and uh, you get the uh, not good imaging overlapping of the L5S1. How to tackle this technical issue? On? Uh, so actually, like uh, Sir was also telling that you need to have a lateral to a medial trajectory. So one should not hesitate to have additional incisions separately for insert to for getting that trajectory from your midline incision. That can be one strategy because the problem is that the fatty lady or the fatty uh, you know fatty person that uh, the soft tissue is pushing your uh, you know hand towards the medial side and you're not going that lateral trajectory. So what uh, one option can be, you just do a stab incision and then pass the screw through that, which is around uh, one, one and a half centimeter lateral to your midline incision, just to get the uh, trajectory right. Yeah, I agree. I think trajectory is quite important. And uh, I mean, I've done, a, I mean, I have a, a gynecologist colleague of mine who was probably me and you put together and uh, L5 S1 spondylolysis operated upon her, did very well, good sagittal balance, and now her S1 screws are broken. And she's massive. So I'll have to figure something out. Very likely I'll have to revise her and then go back into, into pelvis now, either put an eyelet bolt or S2 screws. Um, so they can be quite challenging. I mean, spondylolysis is surgery is not easy surgery to do. Yeah, I find it quite challenging, and, and especially in high grade, I think it should be two consultant operating together rather than one person. Go ahead with your next case. Okay, shall I just stop my yeah. screen share then? Yeah, go, go ahead with the next case. You have one more case. No? I've, got, I've got one more case, which was, yeah. which is what I wanted to show. There was, um, uh, this is another example of spondylolisthesis. And uh, here, the thing that I wanted to highlight was, uh, it's not coming out very well in this x-ray, is that this person has got a higher sacral slope. And uh, look at the lumbar lordosis markedly increased lumbar lordosis. So these are the type of patients we need to be careful about the fact that we need to use, um, use um, SRS classification and make sure that uh, we get the global balance right here. So as compared to this woman, well, I don't think so there was an issue with global balance. Uh, look at the lumbar lordosis there, but look here, this just taking a lumbar X-ray here can be misleading and they require further workup. Shall I, if we have a few minutes, I don't know how we're running with time. Um, shall I go seven, back to... 15 sorry? minutes. Yeah, 15 minutes. Shall I go back to the trauma case um, with that unstable fracture? So there is, I have kept uh, one high grade spondylolisthesis in a woman whom we did uh, dome osteotomy, which itself is a topic of discussion. So maybe for future, but um, it might be worthwhile to have a look at uh, this patient. Is that okay? Trauma patient. Yes, sir. Please. So, this is a patient who came to our recess ward uh, by air ambulance, and he was hemodynamically unstable when he came in, and he was on a spine boat collar, and he was. Um, he was uh, unable to move his legs, so he clearly had neurological deficit. 
and um, he went through trauma CT and uh, there was no other injury. ABC was fine. His GCS was always 15 and we were able to resuscitate him. So no other injury. This was his isolated injury. So now the question is that you got somebody with a spinal cord injury and an unstable fracture. So we have discussed quite nicely uh, with Dr. Rajeshekran that these type of unstable fracture require surgical stabilization. He did mention very nicely about Bob Dixon's paper where it has been shown that uh, the spinal cord injury happens at the time of injury. And there's a strong co-relationship between spinal cord injury um, and injury severity score, but there's very poor correlationship between uh, canal compromise and um, and uh, uh, and uh, and neurological deficit. So I think the we can probably share some thoughts on acute management of the spinal cord injury in emergency department. Um, use of spine board, spine collar, use of steroid. Uh, what about uh, fluid and electrolyte? Um, again, will steroid make any difference? And uh, if we decompress this person, uh, will it make any difference to neurology and how to perform neurological examination in these patients? So is it worth spending a few minutes on this? Yes, sir. So we applied TLIX classification and it was eight. So it was unstable. So there was a definite injury to PCL, had complete neurology, and this was a compression pulse fracture. So for, do we use, as a spelling mistake then, um, what is the role of spine board? And for how long should we use a spine board? That was one question. And the second question was that, um, would colleagues use steroid in this situation? And the third question is that, uh, uh, how the neurological examination should be performed? So I don't know whether there are any comments on this? The spine board should not be used for more than two to two and a half hours because that way they lead to the pressure source and all these problems. So I think that's a very important message for any, any trainees or postgraduate student. Uh, just for uh, transportation, I think. Uh, yeah, exactly. So more than two hours, it causes more problem than it is worth. So I think that's a very important take home message for all the participants. What about steroids? So normally we used to use a steroid in our, uh, what we have been taught and we practice. Uh, let me just say that there is no use of a steroid. I think there's no advantage of the steroid. That's what no, I think. We are not the using steroid. So in our patients, we are not using any steroid for these uh, type of uh, injuries because majority of the patients, they used to come after eight hours in our practice because they are getting referred to us. And if more, they, uh, if more so ever they come, and usually like, we don't give uh, the steroid for this uh, traumatic spine injury. The role of the steroid, uh, we have like uh, in cases of like hydrogenic when we get some problems like uh, neurological post-op neurological deficit. And at that cases, we find handy the steroid. But in cases of trauma, we don't find any significant results with this. I think that is that is really what my thoughts are because um, uh, if you look at NASA's trial in a Brecken paper which supported the use of steroid, that paper was heavily criticized, wasn't it? And then there were um, other papers, randomized control trial, which shows that there was no benefit of steroid. And then there are paper which shows that uh, steroid can cause harm. So with no proven benefit of steroid and with potential harm of steroid, um, the standard guideline in the United Kingdom is not to use steroid in spinal cord injury. However, it is mandatory 
in cord compression in people with metastatic spinal cord compression. We see loads of MSCC. In fact, we see more MSCC than trauma now. And in there, we use, we use uh, steroids. So it's probably something that uh, any postgraduate students or trainees who are participating in the seminar should um, perhaps do a bit of a own literature search read and get some good papers out and, uh, and critique those papers. Are there any questions coming from participants? That, Which is why do you use solumetrol in this MCC? In uh, medical me, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cord compression, uh, dexamethasone, yeah. 8, 8 milligram BD. Okay. So for those trainees who are interested, they can go to NICE website, which is National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and they can uh, download those guidelines to read. Uh, it's quite a good thing to read, you know, it gives you more than adequate information that you need, even for the exam purposes. So if any, any, if there are any postgraduate students, they want to download my guideline, I would encourage them to do that. And uh, that is that a neurological examination that you were asking. So we do successive neurological examination because uh, we wait for the spinal shock to get over. So that the neurology, the final neurology that we can uh, write mm. down in our papers. So we do successive neurological examination these cases. Mm. So what we do in our trust, we, we use this Asia chart. So this you can download from Asia chart. Anybody can download it. And every computer in our world has got one Asia chart saved in the desktop. And there are always few copies printed out. This is not a complete chart. If you, there's a second page there, which will actually tell you how to do neurological examination. It's almost like um, having, a, having a common language. So if you have done neurological examination using this chart in Allahabad, and I've done that in Preston, uh, then you know exactly what I've done and, um, and uh, I know what you have done. And therefore it provides consistency. It uh, uh, teaches junior doctors how to perform neurological examination. And uh, we do them even for non, we had adopted Asia chart for non, um, uh, non-traumatic cases. So for example, if you've done a cervical corpectomy, for cervical myelopathy, for example, uh, they will get um, the ne neurological examination done and documented in Asia chart. So it's worth visiting the website for, for the trainees and to interrogate this website and download this and adopt them into the clinical practice. I think that's uh, enough for the sir, case discussion or you have? I think we should, sir. I mean, maybe we should just see if any of the participants have any questions. No, sir. So far, we don't have any queries. But a uh, lot of uh, uh, young spinal surgeons are uh, listening to you from all over the country. Uh, what is the fellowship program at your uh, center and uh, how, how is the waiting list and uh, how they can approach to you? So we, we appoint uh, uh, one fellow and this is a senior fellowship. So this is for those people who, who have done the CCT or are qualified to be consultant and already got a small experience for a year or two. So, um, we have a current fellow who's a Romanian. And when we interviewed for this person, I had an excellent person from Delhi. But because we were in European Union, the EU law said that if there's a suitable candidate for EU, we cannot appoint anybody from outside Europe. So, and this was used to happen every year. We always used to get somebody from Europe and we used to appoint them. But from this year, from 1st of Jan, we are not in, um, in, uh, in the European Union. So we are 
no longer um, bound by EU law. So which means that um, HR will be looking into it, but hopefully if the fellowship is advertised and we get a candidate from India, for example, and the candidate from EU, by law, we will not be bound to, to appoint um, those people. So um, keep an eye on that word. Uh, this chap is going to finish, I think, in November this year. So there won't be any uh, fellowship coming out for whatever number of months we are talking about. So one benefit of Brexit is uh, that. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, we just have to follow EU law. You just totally, no, you can't. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're very your, welcome. Thank you for your sir, vast experience. And definitely we have got a lot of ex, uh, experiences and our myth buster regarding the spondylolisthesis and management of thoracolumbar injuries. Definitely would like to share uh, more information and listen to you from in the near future also, sir. It was so lovely. I think it is, I, I, would, I would say that it has been sort of a mutually learning um, experience. You know, I mean, I've learned, I've got a lot from Shah and Varun today as well. So it's not just one way, it is, it is always a two-way process. And then uh, talk from Dr. Raj Kupalan was also very nice. Uh, Manoj, as you are the uh, council member of AO Spine, I think, uh, uh, can you tell something about the AO courses which the, these young surgeons can join the AO courses, AO Spine courses basically? Uh, so we are doing, uh, yeah. we are, uh, two things we are doing. Uh, in May, I can't remember the date, I think it's around 25th of May, uh, we are doing a um, uh, AO fundamentals on thoracolumbar fracture for two days, and uh, we are struggling to to cover everything in one and a half day of lectures. So uh, that is one which is coming up, but it will also have practicals, and then we are planning to start um, uh, AO spine webinars. And um, there has been a lot of webinars, a lot of, lot of webinars, and people are actually quite uh, tired of uh, um, attending webinars. So we are thinking to, rather than do a webinar on spondylolisthesis and thoracolumbar fracture and things like that, we are thinking to do a webinar on conditions such as CSF leak. So how to manage a CSF leak, everybody faces that, or um, uh, what pathway or what should be there. You've got a vascular injury when you're doing a lumbar discectomy. So we are thinking to do a webinar on these type of talk, talks. And I'll, I'll keep you updated as, as we do that. I, we had a last meeting, I think, Friday at 8 p.m. or something like that. Sir, we, are, oh, sir. Sir, we are running short of time now, sir. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very thank much, you, sir. Thank, uh, you, uh, thank you very much, sir, for giving a valuable time, sir. Thank you, Dr. Varun. Thank you, Dr. Shah. And especially my special thanks to the Johnson people who have organized all these events and Dr. Awesome. Ashok Shyam, who has given, who has given this opportunity to organize under the Ortho TV. And uh, hopefully those, uh, I'm also thankful to all the delegates who are participated and listened to the valuable lecture. This uh, link will be also available on our club website. So we will share it soon. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you everybody. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Manoj. Thank you, Thank you. And I'm going to disconnect now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Lovely seeing all of you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Bye. Look forward. Bye. Varun, Shah. Thank you. Thank you, Varun. Everybody. Thank you, Shah.